So this morning, as we continue in our study, in our conversations about the Jesse tree, a reminder that it's called the Jesse tree based on Isaiah chapter 11. There's a prophecy there that God gives Isaiah, through Isaiah, about the family tree of, of Jesse, the, the descendants of David, who had been promised would rule on the throne forever in Jerusalem. That, they were going to, that that tree was going to be cut off at the stump. And that later, out of that stump, out of that stump that seemed as good as dead, would sprout a branch, would sprout one through whom the promises would be kept. And so the prophecy identifies the stump of Jesse. And so it's called the Jesse tree because the branch sprouts out of that stump, out of that line that traces it before Jesse and then through Jesse all the way down to Jesus. And so on Sundays, we're going to spend some time looking at how Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises, those promises that are repeated along the way down Jesus' family tree. So today, we listen to those that promise given to Adam and Eve after they had sinned after they had broken the promise that they had made to God, God makes them a promise. So there's, the, the first reading was about creation. And so when I think about creation, when I think about God's creating everything, calling the universe into being by his mere words, by his creating, his sustaining creation now through that word through that system of scientific laws and physics and all of that that he set up in the first place that he sustains and preserves us in this creation i'm just amazed at his grace at his mercy i'm also amazed at god's patience there are a lot of different ways of talking about god's attributes god's creating power Lots of different people have tried to get into God's head as to why he created. But I think that's all just speculation. It publishes books. It keeps theologians off the streets. But one of the things I'd like to talk about today is God's patience. In the King James version of the scriptures, this is oftentimes called God's long suffering. But I think it's more than that. I think it's just, we could rather call it God's loving patience. The same way if you've been a parent and you've had kids that maybe weren't the best kids in high school, maybe aren't the best kids now, but you pray them through each day because you have this love for them that won't quit. You have this love that continues each day to be there in your heart for them. And so you have this loving patience for your kids. If you have a spouse, same thing. You may, may not always like them very much, but you always have this loving patience for them that carries you through those difficult times, those, those rough moments, and also those times of joy. If you have a friend, it's the same way, that you have this loving patience that helps you pass through, move through those rough times and also the good times. So this loving patience of God I have the acorn up there as an example of God's loving patience. If you look at an acorn, I think out on the Johnson side of, the, of that parking lot over there by the preschool, there is a big oak tree. And there are acorns probably about now that are scattered all over the parking lot. It's probably crushed by the cars that park on them. But out of that little acorn, who would have thought that in time you'd have this huge oak tree? Same thing about a maple seed. Same thing about a maple seed, the little bitty things. And while in my backyard, if they end up in my gutter, they will eventually sprout to become the Oregon hydroponic garden, um, that little seed can grow into a gigantic maple tree. We have these giant leaf maples in our neighbor's yard, and those seeds come into our yard as well. And they become huge trees over time. They don't pop up the next day, I mean, if you want, if you're a landscaper, it kind of shows our impatience versus God's patience. 
uh, there's, a, there's a nursery along the Hillsboro Highway that you can go and pay a lot of money, but you can buy a full-grown tree to put in your yard. Kind of an example of how we don't want to wait while God has this enduring, loving patience for us. I think that contrast between how God is and how we are kind of is underscored in the whole fall, the story of the fall with Adam and Eve back in Genesis, isn't it? They couldn't wait to be like God. Every day, they met with God in the cool of the evening, and they had whatever conversations they had, whatever intimacy they shared, whatever reflection they gave of his glory back to them. Somehow, that wasn't enough when the serpent offered that they could be like God, knowing good and evil, that they could be like God right now. They could have it. They went right then and grabbed for the fruit, grabbed for that prize that they thought so important that they couldn't wait. Our impatience, I don't know about you, but I know I am not the most patient person, particularly in assembling things that we buy at Ikea or any place else. Come back from Target with a kit and you take the kit out and you spread it out, the, 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 the instructions out, and I get about to step two before I find out that the screws and the holes aren't gonna quite match. And, or I find out that, there, that there's no part F, but there are two part Gs. And I just lose it, really. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it, go, it does end out on the patio because I just throw it out because I am done. Sometimes it ends, but the project ends up in the closet, ends up in a box somewhere. There's a couple of wall hangings that have yet to be finished because I've lost interest, I've lost patience with the product, with, with the project, because I want it done now. And in my frustration, in my impatience, I ruin it, or I give up on it. And maybe that's how you are too with other things, but there is an impatience with us that wants everything now. We, you know, we have microwave ovens, we have, um, it wasn't enough to have kilobytes of data, we have, we have megabytes, we have gigabytes, so we, we can get streaming internet so quickly that we can watch live news 24 hours a day, seven days a week, isn't that exciting? And that allows us to have our need for instantaneous information met. We want things now. And that inclination in us has gotten us into trouble more often than not. Not only are there ruined projects and unfinished business, but there is a relationship with God and a relationship with others, other human beings family members, friends that have been ruined because we wanted things a particular way right away. We wanted to be like God. And we were impatient. We are impatient. We want God to heal us right now the way we want to be healed. We want God to answer those prayers right now the way we want them answered. And we grow impatient. That's who we are. We, we, we're turned in on ourselves. But God... God shows us in these words that he speaks to Adam and Eve. He shows us that he is lovingly patient as he speaks the promise that he will keep in the birth of Jesus, that someone born of a woman will be the one who overcomes the power of sin that breaks the power of that selfishness that we've given ourselves over to, that selfishness that wants immediate gratification, that selfishness that wants it our way, that selfishness that has dragged us into the grave, the selfishness that has broken us and separated us from God and from one another. This one born of a woman, God says, will break the power of all of that and will buy us back to be sons and daughters of God again. In that, God does not only show us his loving patience with us, that he will repeat that promise again and again until the time is fully come, fully right, 
as Paul writes in, into the Galatians. But it shows us how God is going to act. It shows us that God doesn't give up on humanity. I mean, I told you before, when I'm working on a project and it breaks or it doesn't work, I used to, I used to do these plastic bird models and I got pretty good at that. So I decided to graduate to a ship. And of course, I didn't just graduate to a ship. I graduated to like a full rigged whaling ship. And that didn't go so well. I lost patience and it literally got ended up in the trash. God did not do that with us in Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, he did not just crumple everything up and throw it in the trash and start over. He made this promise and showed in this promise that he was going to stick with us, that he is going to unfold his promise through the birth of a child to a woman. He promises that his interactions with us are going to be at our level, are going to be incarnationally defined. He's going to be with us. And he gives us the key to understand the story of the scriptures as they unfold. Promise in the King James, it used to say seed. The, 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 I'll put an end between, between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, as he's talking to the, sa to the serpent. And so the, I, the focus was on the men as the, in the genealogy, all those names are men, as the promise was handed down, father to son. But the promise is fulfilled through the, through the woman the birth of a woman, uh, the birth of a child to a woman. And that promise gives us the way to understand pieces of scripture like Isaiah 7, 14, when Isaiah tells Ahaz that a young woman will conceive and bear a child and she'll call his name Emmanuel. That promise that God makes in Genesis gives us the right, gives Matthew the right to quote that scripture when Jesus is born as the one who fulfills that promise. Born of a woman. Born under the law, as Paul will say. But born in Bethlehem for us. God's loving patience fulfilled in the promise of one born, an offspring born to a woman. A woman named Mary. As Jesus comes to be the Messiah, as Jesus comes to be the Savior, as Jesus comes to take upon himself all the brokenness, all the selfishness, all the, the, the sin, all the frustration, all of that, all of the fruits of sin in our lives, all of the consequences of sin. He takes upon himself even our death as he goes to the grave for us after dying on the cross to pay the price for our ransom, pay the penalty for our sin. And with his resurrection, raises us with him to live a new life. All of that wrapped up in those words that God speaks in Genesis. As this one born of the woman will crush the head of the serpent promise kept. There's another thing that I hear, another promise I hear in these words given to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve have just sinned. They have just put themselves, basically defined sin. Sin is more than disobedience. Sin is deciding that what you want is more important than what God wants. Sin is deciding that you're God and God is not. Sin is making yourself, your desire, your ambition, your whatever, your choice to be the God in your life in a very plain and simple way of understanding it. So Adam and Eve have just booted, in, booted God out as the God of their hearts. And God, in giving this promise, tells them, tells us something very important that there is nothing you or I can do that will make God stop loving us. Even if we choose to walk away from him, 
even if we choose to show him our back, stick our fingers in our ears so we're not listening to him anymore, even, even if we reject him completely and walk away in unbelief, refusal to believe, his love is still there for us. Even if, even, there is no even. God loves you, loves the world so much that he sent Jesus. He didn't wait for us to behave. He didn't wait for us to do something that would make, it, make, make, it, make us worthy of his coming to be among us. Immediately after Adam and Eve messed everything up, God gives them this promise to show that his love is for you, for me. That there isn't something you and I can do that will make him stop loving us. Make him stop loving and I think that's amazing news. That wherever you are in your walk, wherever you are in your journey, that you have a God who is for you. You have a God who loves you so much that he's willing to bend over backward, go to any extreme, even the extreme of the cross, to show you that love, to show you how much he loves you. That you have a God who loves you so much and will always be there to love you. This is not a time when you can't, when, when you won't know, can't know that God loves you. There might be times where you refuse to know that, but he will always love you, even if, even if you walk away. He breaks his heart, but he loves you still. And that is awesome news that you and I are never unlovable. There's always a reason in God's heart to love you and me. So there's always, the, the door is always open to forgiveness. The table is always set with his good gifts for you, for me. So Jesus is the seed, the offspring promised way back in Genesis. He's also the fruit of the Jesse tree and that the, these promises repeated from generation to generation, this promise that God so loves the world handed down from generation to generation, all those names that Jeff read so well, handed down so that you and I could know that Jesus has done what God had promised, that Jesus has won for us the gifts that God wants to give us so that we you and I could know that we're loved. Amen. And now may the peace that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Again, normally we would have the usher.